Dear friends, good evening and uh, sorry for this delay. There's been a pre-Diwali traffic jam and many of our friends are held up in the northern side of the city. Um, good evening to you again. We are privileged to have in our midst uh, Vice Admiral Pradeep Chauhan, our chief guest and speaker for this evening. Uh, we also have uh, Commodore Uday Bhaskar who will be chairing today's uh, session and uh, we have our own uh, senior researcher Dr. P.K. Ghosh from Observer Research Foundation, Delhi. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the presence of uh, business leaders, members from academia, uh, people from the press, our friends from the Navy who are here in good number. A warm welcome and good evening to you all. Uh, Observer Research Foundation as an organization of uh, 20 years standing and uh, foreign policy and defense uh, has been uh, key areas of uh, research and advocacy and we have several publications to our credit and we've had a lot of experts uh, who have contributed to these publications. Uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in recent months at Observer Research Foundation Mumbai we have uh, started forums such as the um, India-China Forum for Citizens Dialogue and the India-Israel Innovation Initiative. And uh, we've also had uh, talks by the Japanese ambassador, uh, His Excellency Akitaka Saiki, uh, to tell uh, us how Japan coped with the disaster. We also had the Deputy Foreign Minister of Iran um, I'm sharing all this with you because we feel that in this uh, increasingly connected and uh, less hierarchical world uh, order that we are looking at, it is essential uh, that uh, you know, the awareness among the business community and uh, general public on these uh, issues uh, is uh, you know, buffeted. And uh, this is an endeavor by Observer Research Foundation Mumbai to bring opinion leaders and decision makers uh, for our public in Mumbai. So without much ado, I would like to request uh, Dr. Ghosh to introduce our uh, speakers for the evening. Uh, Dr. Ghosh himself is a maritime security expert. He's a senior fellow and uh, he has served in the Indian Navy for 27 years. He's also a co-chair of uh, the Council for Security Cooperation in Asia-Pacific. He's also the lead co-chair of the Maritime Security Group. So over to you, Dr. Ghosh. Uh, thank you, Radha. Uh, good evening, everybody. Um, Admiral Chauhan, Commodore Bhaskar, Admiral, Senior Officers, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it gives me great pleasure to be over here and to finally come to know that Bombay, we are having some uh, maritime activity as far as security is concerned uh, after a long time. So I think it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's all credit to ORF uh, Mumbai. Um, before I um, introduce the speakers, I have been asked to give brief introductory remarks to set the so-called ball rolling. And uh, I have been specifically asked to speak on three subjects. Now, um, they are th basically the Indian Ocean, the Chinese policy of encirclement, also known as the string of pearls policy, and uh, rather the Indian response to the string of pearls, because I'm sure it will be covered later on. And uh, lastly, the South China Seas, which has been in the news for, come, uh, for quite some time, especially recently, where things seem to be flaring up uh, quite a bit. So, Indian Ocean region, the backyard of India's strategic backyard, as it is known, it is undergoing currently, I will not go bore you with statistics with the third largest ocean, 100,000 ships which traverse this, the, uh, the importance of slock sea lines of communication, sea lines of communication energy lifelines, the uh, 
uh, energy resource um, uh, the periphery which demand demand periphery and the resource heartland etc etc what i will just try to bring to your notice is that currently indian ocean region is one in which there is a power struggle this power struggle is you not really very unique and you could have seen this in the late in, in, in the 60s when the british had left the indian ocean region at that time again there was a flux and there was turbulence but certain things were much more defined they knew that with the going away of the british you had the americans coming in so the aspects which were to be decided or debated were what is going to be the the contours of the architecture under the us predominance that was the aspect which uh, most of the people uh, didn't know that was to be decided something similar is happening now but it's much it's much more uh, complex the reason being that um, there is an imperial overstretch as far as the americans are concerned the overstretch arises as you can see and i don't have to define all those aspects uh, of how the americans are clearly spread thin in many of the con uh, in the continental issues rather than the continents there's a perceived erosion of american strategic capability if i may use the term whether that is true or not is a matter of debate which we can possibly take up later on but the perception is there and hence the subterraneous struggle for power is very much there between primarily many upcoming nations we tend to think of of course india and china china is making forays into the indian ocean region um whether we can contain them or there's a lot of uh, media hype about containment of china can you really contain a country which is uh, almost in double digits it's going ahead i don't think so and the fact that their slocks go through the indian ocean i don't think they can be contained and it is fallacy to think that we can what we can do is we can probably channelize uh, the growth of china in a certain manner especially as far as indian ocean is concerned now with this um uh, but one aspect you got to remember and this i'll be very brief in mentioning this there's a distinct change in india's attitude not only in the indian ocean we have become much more self confident not assertive as one would say but self confident <clears throat> assertiveness is an aspect which the chinese are showing right now especially in the south china seas i'll cover it in very brief uh, later on but if you have noticed earlier we the law, were the law obeyers now we are the law makers in many in many uh, in any sense of the term <clears throat> if you remember earlier we used to ask for uh, uh, freedom of navigation now people are asking us for freedom of navigation earlier the countries used to ask us to join their bandwagon when i say countries i mean united states and others now we ask other countries to join our bandwagon there lies the difference so in many ways the clock or the circle has turned and it's been squared um whatever happened to the indian ocean zone of peace hello um that again we no longer talk of we are no longer talking uh, of territorial integrity as far as indian ocean is concerned our actions are much more self confident than that the, i can go on and on of what are the s critical signs to show that india has emerged as a much more self confident power in the indian ocean region but the other power that is coming into it is china you've heard a lot about this string of pearls policy in fact uh, to be quite honest i was sitting uh, along with a lady known as julie mcdonald and uh, and we were two three of us when we coined this term string of pearls policy she was, julie normally doesn't wear much uh, jewelry and that day she was wearing pearls and we said okay let's have this we were having tea she's from booz allen hamilton um and this came out in a report and that 
thing caught on. Earlier it was known as encirclement and counter-encirclement strategies. Um, we have heard a lot about it. Sitwe, I I'll just put the brief headers. Sitwe, Myanmar, Hanbam Tota, even Colombo, the Chinese are there, Gwadar, ad nauseum, and so on and so forth. It goes on. I'm not talking about that. What I'm talking of is, I think there is a focused effort of India to counter this. We may be slumbering. We may be moving slowly. But we are trying to counter it. And we have spread our net fairly wide. You, if you ask Gautam Bambaule, who is the JS, he will uh, go hoarse saying that, look, yes, we are doing something and nobody talks about it. South Korea, in Japan, we are trying to elevate our uh, relationship with South Korea, Japan, you know, the two plus two, of course, it didn't quite work out, but at the moment, it's, the talks are on. Then, Philippines, Vietnam, Vietnamese are the only people who have actually stood up to the Chinese, our interactions with Vietnam, and with Sri Lanka, Myanmar. Whenever people talk of Myanmar, I don't know, but uh, people assume that the Chinese have come to roost in Myanmar. It's not really the case. The Ma Myanmaris are extremely nationalistic uh, people. They will not allow the uh, Chinese to come in and just walk over them. They have been influenced in certain ways, but not so much, and so on and so forth. So we are taking action, but how far or what is the efficacy of this action is a matter of debate, which probably the Admiral will take up. Lastly, about the South China Seas. Um, as you know, I've been involved in CSCAP, so um, I have been trying to sort of uh, try and be a little more involved since there are 22 countries involved and South China Seas is part of that um, in trying to sort out the issue. But let me assure you, I will not go into the technicalities because there are quite a lot of technicalities. China, the baseline from where it goes in order the nine dotted lines. And if you go on to the scientific basis, there is not too much of scientific basis. China claims 80% of the South China Seas. What happens? Ch South China Sea is far for us. Hasn't it occurred to you? What happens if China does get its claims? I think what will happen to freedom of navigation if China does claim all that, hypothetically. So it is an extremely complex issue which needs to be sorted out. And um, with the Chinese getting more and more assertive in the near future and currently, I think it's going to become a very difficult task. That is precisely probably why the Chinese want uh, bilateral engagement in uh, South China Seas. And of course, we have OVL over there with two blocks, one, two, seven, one, two, eight. And uh, I think it's going to be a difficult proposition for us if the Chinese do get assertive with the OVL. Um, these are some of the pointers which I thought I'll raise. Uh, the main talk, of course, will come from the Admiral. Uh, I'll just int <coughs> introduce him. The Admiral uh, is one of the thinking admirals and one of the scholar admirals that we have in the Navy. He's known for his out-of-the-box thinking. And uh, in that sense of the term, um, he's got a very wide and rich experience in the Navy, 35 years. Um, I've, looked, I've got a long biodata office, so I've requested him that I'll, he says, no, no, please don't read out everything. It's very embarrassing. So I will uh, <laughs> not read out everything, but he has commanded a lot of ships uh, the prime one, of course, was INS Virat, and uh, he's been heading the naval training team at the DSSC Wellington, the staff college that we have. Uh, he's been the principal director of naval operations, so he knows what are the nuances of all naval operations. Um, and he headed, the, he, he was the FCI, Foreign Cooperation and Intelligence, in which I think we were both associated with IONS at that time, which was an initiative which I just briefly mentioned earlier. Um, now he's taken over as the Chief of Staff of uh, one of the largest commands in, that the Navy has. Uh, he's, of course, been awarded the Vishat Seva Medal and the Ati Vishat Seva Medal. Um, a word about Commodore Uday Bhaskar. 
Commodore Ray Bhaskar specifically told me, please don't introduce me, I feel very embarrassed. <laughs> he really needs no introduction. You've seen him on TV, you've read his pieces, and I look up to him as, uh, uh, well, a friend, philosopher, guide, and mentor in many ways, because he was the one who got me into this field. Um, suffice to say that uh, Commodore Bhaskar has uh, been one of the leading lights as far as uh, maritime thinking in India goes. And um, he has shaped India's maritime thinking in many ways. And all I can say is that we all hope uh, that we can emulate him in many ways. Earlier I used to have a beard like him. I don't have a beard anymore, so I'm sorry. <laughs> I chopped that off. So with that, um, I would request Commodore Vasco to kindly take the proceedings. Thank you. Thank you for not making it as detailed. I was asked to chair this session. I wasn't quite sure where I would fit in, but now I know roughly what I'm doing. I have a request. Before we request Admiral Chauhan to speak, could I request all of you very earnestly to put your phones off in silent, indiscreet, as the case may be. And as we often say in Delhi, if you don't know how to do it, look right, look left, somebody should be able to help you in, so that we don't disturb the Admiral in the course of his... Uh... Now, we've just had a little... Uh, sort of tete a tete about the time management. As I was entering, I asked Dhawal as to what was the plot for the evening. So he said, we told Admiral Chauhan and requested him to speak for one hour. So I said, oh, you must be a very ambitious man if you think that Admiral Chauhan will speak for one hour. So we just had a little chat, and the Admiral suggested to me that perhaps he could take one and a half, and I said, it would be unlikely that we'll have an audience, you know. So we are doing the equivalent of an Arab bargain. So I'm proposing, if it's okay by you, sir, and the audience, that we request Admiral Johan to speak for about an hour plus, and I'll take the liberty of perhaps just gently reminding him. And if we stop at about minute seven zero, that will give us enough time for discussion because Dhawal suggested that we need to finish by half past seven. And I'm very keen that we should make this interactive. So it's in that spirit, you know, if it's okay by all of you. Since you are using slides, maybe I will just shift to the other side. That would be very nice. So I will remind you, sir, at precisely minute 61. All right. Okay. We have a clock. For the... Do I need this? Yes. Oh, okay. I, obviously, everything is being recorded. Um, I do want to say thank you very much to, uh, first of all, the ORF, and secondly, to uh, my fellow panelists, and of course, Commodore Basco. The time will not start until I say that I'm ready to go. Uh, some very quick uh, points uh, in overarch. The first is that uh, I, I used to be very proud of the fact that uh, I was thought to be an out-of-the-box thinker. Uh, but then I realized that in the Navy, the, when they say the box, they mean the coffin. So, so long as you are breathing in and breathing out, you're doing well. Uh, in fact, that's what many of us in the Navy do. We teach yoga. We tell our enemies, breathe in and then forget about it. Uh, <laughs> So uh, the other thing I wanted to say was that this uh, talk on uh, India's maritime security and the Indian Navy's transformational role is, uh, it's not one of these, um, um, you know, quick uh, slam bam, thank you ma'am variety things. This is serious stuff and it's going to take some time. Uh, I tend to get carried away sometimes as, uh, uh, as Neelam Deo knows only too well. Um, and so I will accept a few small hints uh, apart from Commodore Baskers. For example, should you fall off your chair writhing uncontrollably and frothing at the mouth and banging your left hand on the floor saying, mummy, mummy, in some plaintive voice, uh, I will realize that I've perhaps gone on a bit too long. Something subtle uh, would be just fine. Now, I'm going to take a deep breath. You can start looking at your clock. Uh, it is well nigh impossible to cover a subject as shown on your screen in uh, the time allotted to me. So I'm going to try and speak in rapid staccato uh, and uh, you must nod vigorously and when the, when the white smoke rises from behind me and then we'll know that we have a new papacy. All right, ladies and gentlemen, the maritime security of India is really a function of uh, three facets. The first is the geographic conformation of the Indian Ocean and the Asia-Pacific expanse. The second is India's maritime interests within that zone. And the third is the interplay of the geostrategies of other maritime powers with that of India. Let me start with the geographic conformation of the Indian Ocean and the Asia-Pacific. If you do not know your geography in this area, then you are likely to flounder. 
Well, considering that this is an audience of experts, I do not intend to uh, dwell upon this subject in any great detail. Um, I will ask that you start, we'll start from about there and work our way around the map. Is it okay? Can you guys see? Otherwise, you can just look at me. <laughs> so, uh, vain. All right. We start with the Timor and Arafura Seas. Then you've got uh, the Andaman Sea, the Gulf of Martaban, the Bay of Bengal, the Gulf of Kambat, the Gulf of Kutch, the Arabian Sea, the Gulf of Oman, the Persian Gulf, the Gulf of Aqaba, the Red Sea, the Gulf of Aden, the Mozambique Channel, and the international shipping lanes that pass east of Madagascar. Now, and of course we've got the only the, the Cape of Good Hope or the sea passage around Cape Oglas more accurately. Now, in this area, you know, all of us in the Navy, we are sneakily, uh, extremely uh, taken by the Indian Army. We have a great deal of admiration for them. Uh, I mean, first of all, they provide us so much entertainment. But apart from that, they, uh, the one thing that the Indian Army has and uh, which must go f uh, f uh, entirely in its favor is that all army officers know their terrain particularly well, whether they are generals um, or they are lieutenants. Incidentally, in the Navy and the Army, it takes quite a long time to reach from one end to the other. I, for example, have spent upwards of 35 years moving from a general sort of lieutenant to a lieutenant sort of general. And just to, <laughs> it's not easy being in the services. But in their case, they all, as I said, know their terrain. There is no army officer worth his salt who does not know his terrain. And in the same manner, naval officers too must know their terrain. Our terrain is a bit bigger, a bit wider, a bit more expansive, but nevertheless, its contours are as important to us as defilades, valleys, hills, and so on are important to the army. Now, in this area, this uh, Indian Ocean region differs from the Pacific and the Atlantic in as much as there are only a finite number of gateways or choke points through which you may gain ingress into or egress out of the area. Let me run them by you. They're coming up in red. There's the Strait of Hormuz, which connects the Persian Gulf and the Gulf of Oman. The Suez Canal between the Mediterranean and the Red Sea. The Strait of Bab el Mandeb, of which more and on. Connecting the Red Sea to the Gulf of Aden. You have the Cape of Good Hope. Now, south of this is actually Antarctica, so that's a very large uh, choke point. But nevertheless, if you should go more than 30 miles south of uh, the Cape of Good Hope, you better have a very large ship and believe in God intuitively. Uh, it, otherwise, um, we have music as well. So, uh, uh, obviously, I'm trying my very best to keep you entertained. Right. On the eastern side, you have Malacca, the Strait of Sunda, the Strait of Lombok, and the Ombai Weta Strait. When I normally talk to naval officers, and I say an Umbai Weta, they normally say the same to you. <laughs> so I would just want to stop for a second and tell you about the Umbai Weta Strait. We operate nuclear propelled submarines. So, do, so does China, so does the United States of America. There is only one strait in which a dyed nuclear propelled submarine, I'm not talking about boomers, just a nuclear propelled submarine can transit underwater between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, and that is the Ombai Weta Strait. Otherwise, you have to go all the way around Australia and come in. So, as far as we are concerned, although this will um, find mention a little bit later, Indonesia remains one of the most critical areas as far as maritime activities and maritime diplomacy is concerned. It's much of our effort on that front is going to be, and is already, about Indonesia, because Indonesia controls all those things, all of them. Much is spoken about Malacca, but actually Malacca is nowhere as, as critical to us as a military as is the, Sunda Strait, uh, the Lombok Strait. This one is of particular importance. Major <coughs> super tankers can rarely go through the Strait of Malacca. Uh, VLCCs and ULCCs cannot go through Sunda because of the number of uh, islands in the way, the navigational hazards, and therefore they take the, Umbai, the uh, Lombok Strait. But of course, Malacca Strait enjoys much more popularity. 
Now, the energy resources of the Indian Ocean and the are driving actually very substantial connectivities between the Indian Ocean and the Pacific Ocean. And this is defining what we might call the Asia-Pacific. Actually, the term Asia-Pacific, as I will show you in a minute, for us includes both Asia and the Pacific. And here we differ doctrinally from the Americans, for whom Asia-Pacific means the Asian part of the Pacific. When India uses the term Asia-Pacific, we mean the oceanic expanse stretching from East Africa across to the west coast of the United States of America. So when we say that we are dabbling in the Asia-Pacific region, this is what we mean. Since we are largely Indians, uh, I thought it would important to uh, say this. This, of course, uh, is, is important to us because of the near simultaneous historic rise of as many as four Asian powers. That's India, of course, and no, no prizes for guessing China. Then you have Japan, and you have the 10 countries that comprise ASEAN. In this area, you can see that the maritime security of India clearly has a substantial oceanic or maritime uh, dimension. The, the entire security of India has a substantial maritime dimension, and this is not something new. In fact, uh, Indian uh, history is closely intertwined with maritime activity. You couldn't have done uh, your trade as you did with all these various countries and kingdoms unless you had a sensible amount of maritime trade. There's one problem. The, although the Indians did have a concept of empire, this was rarely and seldom uh, territorial in nature. It was mostly a cultural empire, and that explains why the Indian government, even today, is really terrific at handling soft power. I don't think that there's a, there are many countries in the world who handle soft power quite as uh, dexterously as we do. Um, if there's any problem anywhere, our answer is immediately, let's send Shah Rukh Khan. Uh, if that fails, then we say Malika Shravat. Between the two of them, devastation. Um, however, the, uh, the, the fact also remains, the corollary is also true, that India is singularly inept and quite uh, a baby insofar as the handling of hard power is concerned. We don't know how to do it very well. We don't have much, much experience. We're getting it, but we're not there yet. If you look at this slide, it's drawn from a, from a book called uh, The World Economy, A Millennial Perspective by Angus Madison, and what I want to show you in it is the fact that uh, as the years passed by, India as a civilizational entity rather than a geopolitical one, uh, the share of India's, uh, the share of world trade occupied by India has steadily been dropping. And this is a function of the manner in which you either embrace or abjure global trade. It's a trading thing. It's only when the ruling elites of India forgot these lessons of maritime history that we eventually ended up losing our very independence for upwards of 300 years. And it is certainly hoped that these somewhat harsh lessons of history are not lost upon the modern uh, democratic republic that is India. Let me switch over to India's maritime interests. I need to hold a bottle. I'm a naval officer is defined as the need to assure the economic, material, and societal well-being of the people of India. And I rather submit this as a challenge uh, to any of you to define a more basic core national interest. This is derived from the Constitution of India, although it is not explicitly stated as such, and you will not find it in any white paper published by the government of India. In fact, you will not find any white paper published by the government of India. Um, so when people ask us, I say, aren't you guys too park centric or aren't you too China centric or aren't you, the answer of course is that the Indian Navy is India centric. And the Indian Navy will do such activity as it needs to do in order to preserve, to promote and to protect the core national interest of India, which as I've said, is the assurance of the economic, material, and societal well-being of the people of India. But, but, this term, the people of India, that 
term presupposes the existence of a geopolitically uh, coherent entity called India. If there's no India, there's no people of India. <laughs> One of those technical things. And therefore, the geopolitical entity called India is intimately associated in terms of its territorial integrity to the concept of borders. Now, we're getting on to uh, increasingly slippery ground here. First of all, insofar as our land borders are concerned, they are long, they are daunting, and um, they extend for a substantial distance over almost 16,000 kilometers. But it's wise to remember that almost 1,725 kilometers of this border are disputed. This, these are indicators of past follies of the governments, successive governments of India in their ability to handle hard power. Now the coastline of India is half that length. It's only 7,516 kilometers. But I dare say it faces as many challenges as do our land borders, both internally and by, as well as externally. And if you needed a reminder, it was right there, very close to where we are standing and sitting right now, in November of 2008. And yet, we are at pains to point out to our people that, and our government that, look, this 7,516 kilometers of coastline is not our border. Our maritime border lies a further 12 miles to seaward of that, 12 nautical miles. One nautical mile is 1.852 kilometers. So, why is that relevant? It's relevant because, first of all, let me explain to you, every naval officer whom you ask what's the length of the Indian coastline will instantly pop up like one, you know, jack in the box and say 7516.6, sir. And then you ask him what's the length of the maritime border. And then he will look at you balefully. Because nowhere in the Republic of India today is there an indicator of what is the length of our maritime border. Isn't that amazing? It doesn't exist, the statistic. But of course, how much could it be? How, far, how much further could it be? It's only 12, uh, 12 miles further. And so the, even if you assume, assume them to be circles, and 2 pi r and 2 pi r 1 couldn't be very different. So the exact digits are unimportant, ladies and gentlemen. The fact that we don't know them, that is hugely important. That is very, very important indeed. Because that in, ensures that in your mind, when you stand on the coastline of India, you think you are standing on the edge of the border of India. And once you step into the sea, of course in India when you say word, you play word association and you say beach, it says Belpuri. So we have a little bit of a problem there. But anyway, what I mean is that when you step into that 12 nautical mile zone, as far as you're concerned, you're at sea, baby. In truth, the full majesty of Indian law applies right up to 12 nautical miles. And therefore, you must be absolutely crystal clear, and so must we, as to who is responsible for the maintenance of law in this area. And when, occasionally, we had questions about what is the Indian Navy doing in external affairs? The answer ought not to be, would you like, would you like it better if you were in internal affairs? Because remember, the sovereignty of India as a power is, is closely linked to the ability of India to sustain a democratic form of governance. And in a democracy, internal power, internal matters cannot be handled by the military. The military is an instrument created by a sovereign state in order to contest the will of another sovereign state. It's, that is the instrument. Now, for example, if I asked you to measure the length of this room with a pen or with a protractor, uh, you can do it, but it's not very efficient. If I told you, all right, let's see how tall you are, and then I bring a thermometer. Uh, you're going to think that this guy's really lost it. But I can still do it by any number of ways, except that it's not very efficient. Instruments, ladies and gentlemen, are made for specific purposes for which they are particularly efficient. If you start using them for, in, for purposes other than that, the efficiency quotient drops significantly. 
So, so who's responsible? The police, not the Coast Guard, not the Indian Navy. In that 12-mile belt, it is the police. Now we have a failure chain. State police. Policing is a state subject in India, as you're aware. State police, fail. State armed police, fail. Central police, fail. Central armed police, fail. Paramilitary force, fail. Military. That's the failure chain. What defines failure? Any number of things. Inability to have capacity. Inability to have sufficient capability. Capacity and capability are different. Uh, simply incompetence. Uh, not enough organizational structure. Anything. All of the above. So what we do is you step in to fill the breach that was created by a failure. Which is not the same thing as the media writes about failure, which I'll talk about in a minute. Every time we have Pavel coming alongside, you know. We have this, uh, one day I read a, new, uh, a newspaper article which had the word shocking seven times. Shocking failure of shocking, uh, <laughs> I was pretty shocked myself. <laughs> but we'll come to it. Okay. Let me come. Let me offer you, in coastal security terms, before we go any further, what are we discussing? We're discussing this concept of borders. So in coastal security terms, let me show you something about Pavel. Let me give you a perspective. That's the length of Pavel. It's 90 meters long, and the beam, which is her widest part, a bit like me, is 12 meters in width. Okay? That's the beam. Therefore, you, let's say you, you, you're really tall. You're two meters tall. None of us are two meters tall, including Ghosh. He only thinks he's two meters tall. And let's say you're one meter wide. You're the Incredible Hulk. You've fallen off. You're like a piece of the wall that fell off and decided to go for a walk. So your area you occupy is now two square meters. Power it. 19 to 12, 1080 square meters. Gosh, that seems quite big. Huge. How the hell did this Indian Navy, etc., etc., miss it? But one square kilometer, ladies and gentlemen is one million square meters. So Pavit, which is 1080 square meters, occupies 0.01% of one square kilometer. The area of just the Indian Ocean, just the Arabian Sea alone, is 36.6 million square, 36.6 uh, lakh square kilometers. And so Pavit occupies 2.79 into 10 to the power of minus eight square meters. That's point zero, zero, all those zeros. And so the answer then becomes, gosh, how do you ever think you're going to find it? Because it's when you were small, mommy looked tall. Now you're big. <laughs> okay, so let's take a look at it again. The Arabian Sea, 38.62 lakh square kilometers. The max range at which any radar, my radar, your radar, American radar, uh, Israeli radar, uh, any radar, merchant ship radar, whom do you like? Uh, I might miss some country. French radar. Maximum range at which you can detect a Pavit sized ship at sea is 40 kilometers. Let's do some maths. Pi r squared is the area irradiated by a single radar, which is works out to 5027 kilometers. This area is 0.13% of the Indian Ocean. Therefore, you, the, the number of ships you need to be operating their radars at sea to be able to detect a parbit sized ship is 768 ships. They must all be beautifully arrayed. They must all operate their radars all the time. 24-7, 365, no operator must ever miss. There has to be an operator. But I must have an operator. 24-7, eyes must be wide open, unlike some of the audience. Um, and they must never, ever, ever quit. How much time do you think that you can watch a radar screen without losing something? 
By experience, I can tell you. You can watch it for about 40 minutes. After 40 minutes, you need to get up and go away and somebody else has to come in. Let's assume 40 minutes is not a good time. Let's assume I'm exaggerating. Let's say it's one hour. Every one hour, you need a new chair. That doesn't mean you need 24 chairs, but you need something more than one. Where are all these chairs? All of this beautiful cattle board like arrangement is what will allow you to find this. Therefore, when we talk about when we talk about these coastal security areas, which I'm sure will come up for discussion because I see some, some of the members of the fourth estate are furiously writing, um, we will discuss it further. <clears throat> I want to talk to you a bit more about the perception of borders before I proceed any further. If you ask an army officer, what's the border between, or, or a member of the um, IFS, what's the border between India and Pakistan? They will tell you, well, it's a kind of wavy line and it starts from Sir Creek and it wends its way north, north, eastwards until it comes to Siachen. Correct? That's the border between India and Pakistan. Ask a maritime strategist or a maritime practitioner, what's the border between India and Pakistan? And he will say, well, it's a thin wavy line and it starts at Sir Creek and it wends its way westwards and ends up in Chabahar. So, we have the Indian Army and the Indian Navy and the Foreign Service and the ministries all sitting together and they say, okay, you're good for cross-border activity. <laughs> We're talking about two completely different borders, two completely different areas. The army is talking about that lot, sorry, and we are talking about this lot. Is that a bad thing? Yes, it's a doctrinal flaw. Is it a uniformly bad thing? Of course not. It means that it allows us much more flexibility in reaction than it would have had we all had only one concept of border. But that's not all. In um, maritime terms, India as a country can acquire a neighbor instantly. <coughs> Let's take the case of an aircraft carrier battle group. It has an area of influence which extends out to 740 kilometers, about 400 miles. And therefore, within this area of influence, the land, the sea, the, the, the airspace, the subsea surface, all de facto, if not de jure, belongs to the nation that owns this particular group. It controls it. Now what happens is, if this circle of influence suddenly impacts upon India, then India has suddenly acquired a new neighbor, who while he stays where he is, may even be stronger than we are. So what should we do? We will instantly raise an air base. Ta -da -da. And then, the problem is that aircraft carrier groups can move a thousand miles in a day. So by the time you've done your foundation stone laying, the, the country has gone to a new location. And you put another foundation stone there, and obviously this is a dumb way of doing it. So the only way to handle this sort of neighbor is for you to have a mobile force of your own. That's the only way. It's, it's not a cheap way, but it's the cheapest of the ways. <clears throat> and the purpose for which you need this is so that when you play the Indian Ocean game, the rules of that game are not changed without your say-so, as happened indeed between the 4th and the 11th centuries. And the way to do that is to control the choke points of the Indian Ocean, which is why I showed you what the choke points were. Does that mean that the Indian Navy is going to be there standing there with one white flag? No. It means that we must be able to influence these people and these nations, of which I will talk a bit more. Now this has become a tri-service activity, as opposed to a simply naval one, which is a good thing all around. We have now an involvement of the Indian Army and the involvement of the Indian Air Force. All of us are growing. In fact, the Indian Navy, when, uh, when India became independent, the assets of the Royal Indian Navy were divided up between the newly independent states of India and Pakistan. And India got 33 ships off these guys. There were two, TWO2, two ships that were capable of going out to distances over 24 miles. Everything else was a collection of sloops, minesweepers, uh, boats, harbor launches, grandmothers bathtub with an outboard motor, any damn thing that would float 
carry one flag and do fat 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 noises behind you was considered good enough for the Indian Navy. In the, in the years that have passed, of course, we have grown, and this slide offers you some indicator of this growth. And it's a good thing that we've grown. It really is, because <clears throat> when people ask us, what if growth is considered to be a vector quantity with a component of direction and a component of speed, then what is it that is driving the direction and speed of the growth of the Indian Navy? And the answer, of course, is maritime interests. And here they come, and the maritime interests have grown as indeed has our Navy. That's the one we've been talking about thus far. This is ensuring stability, protection from threats, contribution and contributing to our energy security by ensuring the security of energy, protection and safety of India's overseas trade and our sea lines of communication, protection and sustainable exploitation of the resources of the EZ, and supporting scientific research, including that in Antarctica. Finally, provision of support and extrication options to the Indian diaspora. First, let me talk a few, a few minutes about each of these. Not each, a few of them. Start with the fact that, uh, ladies and gentlemen, the Indian Navy is convinced that money is a coward. Money doesn't go where there's uh, turbulence and risk. Let's say that uh, we've got the Sixth Pay Commission, and I ask, um, I ask uh, Commander Ashwin Arvind, I say, hi, Ashwin, uh, let me invest your money for you. And he looks at me and he says, why is an admiral type of So he says, okay, sir, where will, where will we invest? And I say, Somalia. <laughs> and he looks at me and says, you know, were you born stupid or did you have to practice? <laughs> why is he going to say this? Because Somalia is filled with turbulence and risk and money doesn't go where risk goes. And therefore, ladies and gentlemen, we do not have money going into all these unhappy places. And don't forget, if our core national interest is the economic, material, and societal well-being of the people of India, then we must make sure that money comes in and little money goes out. And therefore, we are uh, driven to ensure stability in our maritime neighborhood. And you must be clear about what is our maritime neighborhood. Unlike many countries which are more fortunate than us, we have a neighborhood that has very few neighbors and too many hoods. <laughs> So what we do is we try and do a risk assessment and risk as you know is the probability of occurrence of an event versus the magnitude of the resultant loss if that event should occur. The graphic is good for those who can't see the text. Um, so when we do our risk mitigation, what we try and do is we try and shape the probable maritime battle space and therefore we are not functioning in this regard as acolytes of the Ministry of External Affairs. We are functioning as militaries which are seeking to shape the battle space before the battle. This business, let me explain, give it to you in two examples really rapidly. You know, uh, this is the Makran coast of Pakistan. And on this Makran coast or off it, there are many air bases from where fighter jets fly. Tom Cruise and all those various gentlemen. And we draw arcs around those points and we say to ourselves, okay, uh, this is the arc around which, in which there is active danger from fighters, from fighter ground attack aircraft. Of course, there are other dangers, but I'll just talk to you about one. And that means that we can operate outside that in an area which could be uh, indicated as being one of relative freedom. Yes? Yes? So far good? What if the points from where those arcs were drawn could actually be shifted across to East Africa? or to the Arabian Peninsula, then obviously the area of relative freedom will shrink. And therefore it is in my military interest to make sure that that doesn't happen. It's not about the MEA at all. It is about us. Similarly, if Sri Lanka was to be able to give refueling facilities to Pakistani conventionally powered submarines, it would change the Indian Navy's entire concept of operations on the eastern seaboard. I would not be able to redeploy it. Therefore, Pakistan will try and make sure that Sri Lanka does give it, and we will try and make sure that Sri Lanka doesn't. How do we do that? Do we actually go and catch the nearest chap by the neck and say, if you have a fueling facility, they need to have a deeper sea Of course not. 
We say it by the name we never do that. We say, hi, wouldn't you like to come and have cocktails on our ship? And then those people who need to see the cocktails, they see the cocktails. Those who need to see the missiles, they see the missiles. All messages are passed subliminally and no face is lost one way or another. Therefore, we are engaged continuously, ladies and gentlemen, in what is known as perception management. I'm engaged in it right now. You are gathering perceptions about me. I hope they're good ones, but they may not be. If they're not, I'm going to work very hard to convert them. If they are, I'm going to work very hard to sustain them. And since all this business of perception management goes on in the minds of the countries that are involved, clearly we need an engagement strategy for that. And the, the impression that we seek to create, or the perception that we seek to create, is that of a geostrategically and militarily significant force that cannot be ignored, trifled with, or opposed without great cost. Next, trade. Trade. Where trade goes, the flag follows. India has now a fairly substantial merchant shipping fleet. We have 1,071 ships at 10.45 million gross registered tons. 90% of India's trade by volume and 77% by value flows over the seas. Therefore, to all intents and purposes, India is an island nation. And the question to be asked is, yes, but where are the islanders? Ganga Talao. That's the best we can do. We are in grief. Okay. It's 1998. I'm Principal Director of Naval Operations in Delhi. We have only 480 ships, only 6.98 million GRT. We're only managing 34% of our trade on Indian flagships. It's now 2011. I'm Chief of Staff, Western Naval Command. We have 1,071 ships. More than double. We have two thirds more than we had, a third more than we had in terms of gross registered tons. But now, ladies and gentlemen, we have only 8% of our trade being carried on Indian bottoms. What does that mean? It means when you say, sir, go out and protect India's trade, I don't know what to do. I have no clue. Because when the government of India, in its magnificence, tells me, Go forth, sally on, and uh, protect the Indian flag. I may end up protecting Indian flag, foreign owner, foreign crew, foreign cargo. So Indian flag, Filipino crew, Chinese cargo. How would you like me to do this? <laughs> so when we tell the joint secretaries this, Sometimes it occurs to me that, you know, when I once met an additional secretary who was great, who uh, you know, the government of India secretaries are not very given to frivolity. Um, but he told me about the time when they used to sit and roll their cigarettes in college days. He told me, why do you think they call us joint secretaries? <laughs> <laughs> uh, many of the comments I make are off the record. Uh, <laughs> in any case, I'll deny them in the morning. <laughs> okay, we follow continuously the changes in the direction of our external trade very clearly. And therefore, Indian naval officers are expected to follow the economic survey of India as a minimum reading, uh, as minimal reading material through their, through, through their senior tenures. For example, the UAE is India's third largest trading partner on the planet and our largest export partner on the, in the world. Did you know that? Similarly, trade with Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique, and South Africa is burgeoning. On the other side, on the eastern seaboard too, trade imperatives drive maritime security. And we have trade with Malaysia, Singapore, and Indonesia multiplying. But for the last four years now, our largest trading partner on the planet is China, having, super, having overtaken the United States of America particularly, because you must club China and Hong Kong together. So we have a dilemma. Our biggest trading partner is also one of our biggest areas of worry. 
The West Asian sub-region is critical to us for at least three main reasons. One, of course, is the huge movement of energy. Over a thousand million tons of oil from West Asia passes close to our shores each year. And much of that is, of course, meant for our own economy, although a substantial sum goes across to the economies of Europe and an even greater amount goes off to China and Japan. I want to talk to you for one second about the difference between energy security and security of energy. This is not about semantics. Energy security is the extent to which available or assured energy exceeds the demand. Security of energy is the physical and fiscal flow of that energy as it moves. So the government of India worries about energy security. The Indian Navy worries about the security of energy. Okay. Trade. <clears throat> also concern, concerning trade is the Gulf of Aden and the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb. We have almost $50 billion worth of imports and $60 billion worth of exports transiting the Strait of Bab el-Mandeb every year. Naturally, we are unhappy when this trade is um, affected adversely by anything, including pirates. And that is why since November of 2008, at least one major combatant of the Western Naval Command is continuously on patrol and continuously doing the things that they need to do. Let me give you some statistics. Last year, the average sailing days for um, major competence of the Western Fleet was 280 days. Have you any idea what I'm saying? 200 and, there are only 365 days in a year. 280 days ships, major competence of the Western Fleet were at sea. No taking your families with you. No having little things on the side. There was a time, you know, when naval officers were known as uh, having a girl in every port. Now we're a lot less fussy. We're, we're quite happy with a little bit of port in every girl. But <laughs> on, a more, on a more serious note, this is actually 280 days is no joke. <laughs> yes, yes, a little bit of port is not the uh, <clears throat> So the the um, Upshot of it is that the Indian Navy operates in all its areas along five salients. The first is dissuasive actions. Dissuasion is different from deterrence. Dissuasion says or attempts to prevent you from acquiring the means to do something. Deterrence seeks to prevent you from utilizing those means. So when we, when you talk about it in nuclear terms, dissuasion, we dissuade you from acquiring nuclear weapons. Deterrence, we deter you from using nuclear weapons. In anti-piracy terms, we tell the Somali fishermen, hi, remain a fisherman, do not become a pirate. That's dissuasion. He becomes a pirate and you say, you became a pirate, but I will not allow you to, to execute a piratical act. That's deterrence. Then you have preventive actions. Gosh, I couldn't stop you from committing a, a piratical act. I will prevent it from happening, from succeeding. Up to here, no problem. The Indian Navy is right there, up with the best of them. Then you have curative actions. That means you succeeded in a piratical act. Now we have a problem. How does the Navy stop pirates? What do you do? You say, what do you do? You say, stop. That's roughly what you do. You say it on the radio. You say, stop. And he says, na, 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 na. It infuriates us. We're not really used to listening to this kind of thing. So we don't know what to do, uh, we say stop in a nice more stentorian tone. And then we say fire across his bows. So one gunshot goes boom across the bows. That's a pretty unmistakable signal, but what if the guy says -na 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 -na. Then? then you have to say fire into him. As soon as you say that, that slide I showed you, on a ship, cargo, flag, comes into play. Now you have them asking us, who asked you to fire? Did you own the ship? No, sir. Did you own the cargo? No, sir. The crew member who died, was, was that your nationality? No, sir. 
So we don't, this is where that other breed comes in, you know, the, the lawyers, the international lawyers. So, handling curative action is quite complex. <coughs> then you have punitive action, which the Navy is good at. Which means, we'll get you, if not you, you, some other you, if not in this place, some other place, and if not in this time, some other time. But for this, you need government will. As uh, the successes of anti-piracy patrols on the, in the Gulf of Aden area improved, the pirates have started to move more and more towards the central Arabian Sea. This is at the limit of our <coughs> exclusive economic zone, which is 200 miles from our baselines. And piracy is actually occurring largely in this area. Now this area is outside the national jurisdiction of India. So, what happens is you sign an international treaty and you ratify it. When you do that, you are obliged as a nation to now enact legislation in support of your obligations. But in the period that we signed all that under the laws of the sea, who thought that we would be dealing with pirates? So, India, with its parliament engaged in so many other things, um, was unable or did not pass legislation to support the obligations that it took under the United Nations Law of the Sea, which is the only legislation in which piracy is defined. Therefore, 